Hello and welcome to another Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast series episode. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Hopefully you're familiar with Fisherman's Post. We've been coming at you since 2003 with Fishing Report and Fishing News, with Fishing Tournaments, Fishing Schools, a number of events. And now we're very excited about this new avenue, the Saltwater Podcast series. And what we do is we bring in local guides, local captains from up and down the North Carolina coast, um, bring them in to talk to them to help you guys, our audience, learn how to catch more fish more often. Our goal is to get you out on the water more, to get your confidence up, to get you enjoy your time on the water more. And hopefully this Saltwater Podcast is just yet another way that Fisherman's Post help makes that happen. Um, in this particular episode, we're bringing in Captain Luke Donay of Spot On Guide Service, um, working out of the Cape Fear River area. I was going to say Ca Carolina Beach, but we'll say Cape Fear River area. And he's going to be talking about location, tactics, and gear. So we're going to cover inshore flounder fishing. You know, So we're specifically focused in this episode on inshore <laughs> flounder. And again, that's location, tactics, and gears. And uh, once again, as I am in every episode, I'm joined by my co-host, Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. How What's you doing, up, Billy? Gear? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm doing great. You're looking good. I haven't seen you in a little bit. Well, We've had man. a little time off. It's good. But I'm excited to be back at the podcast seat, and I'm excited to talk to Luke. Absolutely, man. One of my favorite people. Um, you know, I've been setting some seminars with him while he's teaching. Some of the best teaching I've, I've heard about flounder fishing. So... I, I mean, him and his wife have always laughed at my bad jokes, and so he <laughs> holds a certain near and dear spot to me, too. Um, help us out with some of the business of the podcast. Yeah, so we're going to give a little shout-out to our sponsor, as you can see right here between Gary and I, um, whichever way I get a point there, Marine Warehouse Center. So I'm going to go ahead and play a commercial. They get a nice little 30-second spot, so hang on for 30 seconds, check out their commercial, and we'll be right back. Marine Warehouse, we have boat, motor, and trailer sales. We have parts and accessories in our store, and we have a complete service department that will work on anything you have. At Marine Warehouse Center, we offer a large selection of boating supplies, trailer parts, and a large inventory of new trailers. What I love about Wilmington is being out in the water, being in a boat. It's my job, but also my passion. The best thing about working at Marine Warehouse Center is being able to help people get out and enjoy being on the water. Excellent. Yeah, man. Awesome. Oh, oh wait, you're going to do one of those Emmett things again, aren't you? As a matter of fact, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I have one here, but this one's true. Oh, it's true. Okay. And this isn't so much about Emmett as it is Marine Warehouse Center. Not many people know this, I guess, other than the people who buy new boats from them, that when they get a new boat on the lot, Emmett likes to hide a $20 bill somewhere on that new boat he sells the boat, and then the week before Christmas, he calls up that boat owner and tells him where to go to find the $20 bill. That's true. It would be cool if it was true. <laughs> oh, God. It would be cool if it All was right, true. That's cool. That's a new Christmas idea for Marine maybe, Warehouse. Maybe we could send people over to Marine Warehouse Center just to, like, scour through the boat, see if they can find the $20 <laughs> bill without buying it. Hey, that's what I, I mean, that's what I'd be doing. <laughs> If you guys see anybody creeping around your uh, your lot there, don't worry. I'm just looking for for food. <laughs> Billy, show me a fish photo. Here you go. Here's Davis Henshaw of Wilmington, North Carolina, with a redfish that he caught and released near Wrightsville Beach uh, on a Mirodine lure. Uh, so there you go, man. Nice looking redfish. How can someone else be featured? So if you are want to be featured on our podcast or in the Fisherman's Post newspaper or on our social media accounts, be sure to submit your pictures to at Fisherman's Post or Fisherman's.post on Instagram. That's the best way. And when you submit your pictures, make sure you include your name, where you caught the fish, or general location, some information that we can put a really good caption together. So that's how they can have a chance to be featured. Man, we love fish photos. Can never get enough fish photos. You know, would love to see what you guys are up to. The weather's improving. More people are getting out. And so please send us. And we never complain about getting too many fish photos. Um, Billy, I have an assignment for you this week. <laughs> All right, perfect. I'm thinking, I just want to make sure, I'm not accusing of anything, but I just want All to make right. sure that 
while me and the captain are talking that you're paying attention. I mean, you're over there pressing buttons and I just assume that you're paying attention. But in the spirit of keeping you honest, you have an assignment All right. in, in this episode. <laughs> when we come back together, after we hear Luke Donay talk all about inshore flounder fishing, I want you to give me the Billy Thorpe, Thorpe Creative, best takeaway. Best, okay. Best takeaway from the podcast. Best takeaway from this podcast episode. All right, all right, all right. I got it. I think I already have one, so I'm good to go. Well, that would be cheating. <laughs> hey, let's bring our guest. Let's bring the talent onto the screen. Um, I'm joined today by, I told you, Captain Luke Donay, spot on guide service. How you doing, Luke? Hey, guys. How are you? Man, we're doing great, and it's great to talk to you. Um, talking to you reminds me of the upcoming, you know, Fisherman's Post uh, inshore tournaments. You know, that's how I equate you. You also love fishing with your regular. Luke, before we get into this week's episode, catching flounder inshore, mm -hmm. I, like to, I like to phrase this question in a blunt way. And I do it on purpose for effect. Why should anyone listen to what you have to say about flounder? <laughs> I ask myself that question every day. <laughs> no, it's uh, honestly, I'll, I'll tell you, man, we, uh, you know, flounder fishing holds a, definitely a special place in my heart, always has been. Um, you know, uh, I'm from a military family, so we moved around a lot, um, trying to find local knowledge about anything, especially flounder fishing, especially around our area, is really difficult. Um, so to, to go and try to find things that, that really worked for me, um, really kind of changed the way I saw flounder fishing being done. Uh, you'll see that in the upcoming when you see the rigs that I use and the type of rods and the things that I do are a little bit different than what a lot of other people do around the area. So, and that's just from, you know, doing things by, um, you know, basically trial and error, uh, at a lot of trial and error, but I'll tell you, it, it, it works. And, uh, and hopefully I can bring that knowledge on you guys. Well, I tell you what, before, before I give you 35 minutes to tell me to put bait on a hook and put it on the bottom, <laughs> Worms. We, <Those> have, <laughs> we have a segment here, for better or worse, called Two Questions, is where I ask the, question, the captain a couple of questions before we get into the material that are absolutely not fish-related. And okay. so I was trying to think of what would be appropriate for Luke Donay. I even made a graphic. <laughs> So oh, this is how we spell your name, yet we pronounce it Doné. Right. The T is silent. And so I was wondering if you could please pronounce this word for me. Ah, yes. Moulé. Okay. Moulé. Uh, Moulé. <laughs> That's pretty good. At the end of the day, fishing all the time, I have that Ode Moulé all over me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I knew that very well, that word very well. Well, now well, I'm going to transition out of that. And now I'm going to, now I'm going to test your vocabulary. Mm. Doné is a great word. Great word ends with a silent T. Luke Doné, give me one other word that ends with a silent T. Mm. Billy can help you out. Parfait. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why I looked at Billy. <laughs> I don't know why you're looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> but that absolutely works. You've passed. Luke Donay, we can proceed. Awesome. awesome. You have successfully navigated the two questions. I think if I'm reading the notes correctly, we're going to begin the flounder talk with location. Yeah. Man, location is, is definitely key. You know, I think uh, um, talking about flounder fishing, especially inside, um, you know, looking for the right areas to flounder fish and especially if you fit if you haven't fished a certain area before um you you really need like so for instance i i fish on the cape fear river so on the cape fear river predominantly i really like an outgoing tide right and so i look in, in, in areas that that are best on an outgoing tide like you look at small rice creeks that are outflowing into the river you look at the northern side of the barrier islands on an outgoing tide where that water would split. Um, you know, so, so things like that are going to really help you um, if you haven't fished in a certain location before. Uh, there, one of the, there's going to be two things that I bring up that I'm going to go back to a lot, and there are two main points. And if you 
can take away anything from listening to me on this podcast, there's two big things. And I'll, the first one is time on the water. Flounder is especially tough to, to, to really target. Big flounder are tough to target. You can't just go to the same spot every time and hope a big flounder's there. So you're only going to figure out when those, when those flounders start to merge to, say, one side of the river or the other side of the river or in pockets of clear water where that pockets of clear water is moving. Um, you're going to have to spend time on the water. So, you know, I can give you 50 spots right now and you can go out and try to fish them. But if you don't know how or, or what time to fish them, it's really not going to do you any good. Um, so so just know that in, in the first uh, part of that. So well, we can have uh, we can have Billy bring up Google Earth and you could give us 10 of those 50 spots. Um, Let, me have <laughs> Let me just plug in my phone real quick. I'll, be, I'll get it done. All right. Sorry to interrupt with a bad joke. Keep moving. Keep us moving forward, Luke. Yeah, no, for sure. It's, um, so, so think about this on location too. Location with flounder and time of year are going to be are going to be big. So, um, you know, flounder migrate, especially southern flounder. They migrate offshore. Okay, so in the winter time, around November time frame, they start moving offshore to go breed, find breeding ground somewhere, sometimes upwards of sixty miles offshore. So when they're coming back in, you know, late February, March, April. And they start getting back up into their areas. Well, they're going to become, be coming back into uh, the mouths of the rivers, mouths of the uh, intercoastal waterway, uh, like Carolina Beach Inlet, Wrightsville Beach Inlet. Those type of areas you're going to want to hit early in the season. You know, to go hit way up in the creeks, way up in uh, you know the Cape Fear River first thing in the season, you're not going to do yourself very well. So you want to get where those fish are coming back in from from uh, from from breeding offshore. So, you know, so the beginning of the season, you're going to want to hit those types of areas, um, you know, and as the months get hotter and get later, they're going to be moving further and further up into the creeks and higher into the river. Um, and uh, and so that's on location. I would kind of think about that same thing in the fall when they start to move out and go um, go to breeding and get ready to breed, they're going to start following those last schools of, of mullet and, and bait fish that are also moving offshore. So you're going to go back in the late fall to those types of areas to find those really big fish. I like that seasonal explanation about the migration pattern. Um, when you when you first started talking, you were talking about outgoing tide. And mm. I wanted to follow up there like, like why I understand about moving water, why outgoing tides specifically? Sure. Um, there's, there's a couple, couple reasons. One, especially in the areas that you're going to hit, especially at Creek mouths, rice creeks, things, things are going to be outflowing. Well, predatory fish know that at some point, all the bait fish that have been hiding up there in that Creek have to come out because they can't hide in the grass anymore. That tide gets above that mud line and they can sit up in the grass at a higher tide. So they're going to sit there and be hiding, but at a certain point they have to come out or they're going to die. So they start flushing out of these, 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 uh, these creek mouths and these chutes and fish know that. And so they're going to sit right there at the mouth and, and be ready to, to feed on it. Um, and it, another interesting thing about the flounder is that, one, a flounder has no air bladder because so of course it sits on the bottom, but but also flounder don't necessarily move around to feed. Okay, they're going to sit there and stay stationary on the bottom. Well, by doing that, they have to face into the current, not just to see the bait fish coming to them, but to breathe. They have to have water flowing over their gills. Regular fish are swimming in a direction, forcing water over their gills where flounder are staying still. So they have to have a limited amount of current just to have enough oxygen to be able to stay there uh, and wait for the bait fish. So always know that when that current's flowing in a certain direction, their face is always faced into the current. So, you know, when you're fishing, especially up current, you want to going to want to throw above them and then drift that bait down to them. Um, because they're, otherwise you'll be touching their tail or touching their back and they're going to be shooting off. So, you know, these types of creek mouths and things back on that type of thing, they're going to be faced up into that current, wait for that bait fish to come out so they can ambush it. So are you, if I'm targeting a creek mouth and I'm, mm -hmm. so you're anchored up 
outside the creek mouth. Are you anchoring up like right in the middle? Are you trying to cast directly up the creek mouth and then bring it directly down? Are we working the sides of the creek mouth and and or like if I'm casting it up and I'm bringing the bait back with the current, then mm. isn't there the risk of that egg sinker smacking that flounder before the bait fish gets to it? Well, there's always a risk of that. Um, but, you know, ultimately, and going back to your first question, the answer is yes. You're fishing all aspects of it. Um, it you know, especially if you don't know that creek mouth, you don't know that there is a, a drop off on one side and a shoal up on the other and an oyster bed at the end of one point and a, you know, a sand flat on the other. If you don't know that, then yeah, you're going to be fishing that whole area of that creek mouth. Um, you know, I love eddies. Um, if you can find an eddy coming off of a point, mo most of the time that happens because there's a drag, uh, you have a, you have a land point coming out, but then you also have a drastic transition of, of high and low water. And so that's, what's kind of creating that eddy and the flounder love that because it disorients the baits and it gives them a better chance to, to snag that bait fish. And so at this time of year, I mean, we're talking in spring or late spring, early summer. Creek mm -hmm. mouths, rice creeks, and then you were also talking about what you're talking about the northern side of the spoil islands is yeah. yeah. So so one of the one of the best things about the river is that it also gives you the little spoil islands within it. So it's you're not just having to fish the creek mouths or the river banks and that's it, right? So the the main channel, uh, way back when when they blasted everything through, they had to have a place to put the spoils of that channel, digging that channel out. So that that created those islands. Um, so on those islands, depending on the tide, so if you have a river with an island, right, and let's say it's the river's going north and south, right? So on an outgoing tide, that current would be moving south. So what you, where you would want to fish is actually on the north side of those islands, because what it happens is that current's going directly into that island and then splitting that water off on each side. That's, that disorients baits. And they love that. So right where that split's happening, you want to fish right there at that split on the north side of the islands. Now, if any one of those islands has kind of like a tip that comes out and it's creating an eddy like I was just talking about, fish that as well. Now, on an incoming tide, go directly on the opposite side and do the same thing. So what about... I mean, I follow all that. What about like structure, you know, because some people are going to be hearing this and aren't necessarily fishing in the Cape Fear River. So yeah. maybe you can talk to me about two things. One thing, I'm, and this is something I'm always sort of, you know, I wrestle with mentally when I'm on the Cape Fear River is that so much of those shore banks look fishy, like everything looks fishy. So maybe mm -hmm. first talk a little bit about what you look for in a river bank and the shore bank, and then maybe talk a little bit about you know, how you might look for or target structure in the Cape Fear River, you know, with me being able to make a connection to structure somewhere else. Yeah. So, um, like I said, saying, if it depending on where you're at, you don't have to be in the Cape Fear River. You can be anywhere to, to, to see this. And I always, I always preach structure, but to go to your, to your first, your, uh, your first statement, um, when you're going and you're kind of looking, um, for areas, you know, like you, all you can see is top of the water and everything above it. And you haven't, you haven't fished the area. You don't know, kind of know what's going on. What do you look for? Like I said, you look for eddies. Uh, if you're going and you're, you know, say fishing a bank, I love probably my favorite place to fish for flounder is in an area that has moderate current that has a ledge up to the bank that that might be a foot or two feet of water but has a really deep drop off nearby um flounder especially large flounder love an immediate drop off but they will go up on that little ledge to feed i found where bigger flounder will they they learn over time they realize why am i chasing down you know bait fish in this monstrous water column when i can sit there and sit in a foot or two feet of water if the conditions are right temperature current so on and so forth where they're just chasing fish in a foot or two feet of water but have an immediate deep drop off um to either retreat from predators or retreat from temperature things like that so um that's my favorite thing to look at i've every single double digit flounder that i've caught i've caught in, in less than two feet of water Wow. So it's, wow. it is, you know, I've caught, you know, big fish and, and, and deeper water, but literally all my biggest fish came in less than two feet of water. So, and the, 
but the banks will produce like i i follow i mean I, the the logic makes sense as far as less water less work yeah and i guess with flounder fishing you're covering everything though it's not like you won't fish a bank but you just really yeah, like that definitely. one to two foot ledge yeah i mean and once again if you don't a lot of times you don't know what's there unless you're grid pattering you know a certain area to figure out where things are at um you know what if you're just working a bank right i like to work a bank that has uh that has a basically that this does not flow exactly with the current so if let me explain so if you have a current running north and south and you have a bank that might be kind of edging out to maybe a little bit into the current where that current's hitting that bank and having to redirect that water that is a great ambush spot as well so you know, to find something where that current isn't exactly flowing directly along that bank, but might be like fighting with that bank a little bit, a lot of times we'll hold flounder in that as well. All right, now transition over and talk to me a little bit about structure. Yeah, for sure. Structure, structure, structure. Um, it's If you're not losing rigs, you're in the wrong spot. Um, flounder, especially big flounder, they love big structure. Uh, it, it may be oyster beds, it may be a sunken boat it may be a stump it may be you know just anything submerged um i'll tell you that's why S snow's cut is so good it's a pain in the butt to fish but it it holds some huge huge fish but you know main reason it has structure all sorts of different structure down there and it's a huge funnel for bait fish so it's kind of like a perfect you know a perfect storm of of uh events where, where fish can go in um but structure is structure is huge so that's why i have and we'll bring up here later my rig why i do my rig the way i do because i i go through so many rigs because i get them hung up on structure and by having it the way i do you're not losing your whole rig but yes yeah, structure is huge if you can find some good structure on your depth finder or a good ledge where there might be an eddy flow on top of it or drop off in the current so on and so forth that is uh that's that's huge as well and, and a, a lot of people like to sit there and talk about fishing in holes for flounder. Believe it or not, yes, find those holes, but fish on the outside of those holes, maybe in the shallower areas of those holes. Deep in the bottom of the holes, normally the, you won't really find much of anything. Up on the banks, maybe going to it, maybe on the top sides of it, on the ledge drop-offs, things like that. But fishing deep down in a big hole, it just, it's not happening. Okay. So, uh, not normally anyway. So, well, I mean, uh, I'm not quite sure. We talked about in the notes. We talked about location and tactics. We've already sort of blended into tactics a little bit. So, I guess at this point, I'll say, any final thoughts on location, and then you can take us further with where you imagine with tactics. Yeah. Um, once again, location uh, really changes with flounder. Um, it's not necessarily, they don't necessarily every year will go to a certain area. Um, that's why it's so important to be out there as much as you can, even if it's just for an hour or two, because a lot of times, whether it's due to wind or whether it's due to, um, you know, clarity, clarity is huge for flounder. You're not going to catch flounder in dirty water. If you are, it's, man, it's a, it's a miracle. Find the clearest water you can, which a lot of times is really difficult. Um, but if you can find a pocket of clear water with right conditions, man, really hit that hard. Um, but, but yeah, so, so location is, is one of those things where flounder changes all the time. But if you know what to look for, if you take a couple of these things on, okay, I see an eddy over here, or I see a, an adverse current condition over here or on my depth finder, I see a drop off or a ledge where there might be an ambush point, or I see this big stump or a couple stumps on my depth finder, man, fish it, fish it hard for sure. So clear water, like clear water means something different when we're talking about Cape Fear River and we're talking about say Wrightsville beach. So maybe help me out a little bit there. Yes, for sure. Believe it or not, the Cape Fear River gets clear water, but it's not like you think. Um, the Cape Fear River, actually, the darker the water, the clearer it is. Um, the lighter color water, the actual cloudier it is. You want your, you want your river to look like, like dark coffee. You don't want it to look like a latte. Okay, so it's like, even though it looks lighter and it, sh it should be clear, it's not. You actually, the darker it gets, you actually can see deeper. It's just the tannins from, from rotting vegetation way up in the river that's making it that dark color. It's, it's so super fine, you would never, you could see right through it. Whereas, 
you know, when the lighter it gets, it's from the wind churning up the bottom and you really can't see anything. So you want at least, you know, I'd say at the very least one foot visibility, if not a foot and a half, but I normally like two to three foot visibility trying to find those pockets of clear water and you can, you can find some decent fish. What about that clear water, like around Wrightsville beach? What about clear water intercoastal? Is that productive? Oh, it's always clear up there, man. It's uh, which is, and which that's is awesome. good for um, flounder. Yeah, it is really good for flounder because not only is it so clear that it's not that you're sight casting for flounder, you're sight casting for structure. You can see where those oyster beds stop. You can see where those ledges drop off. You can actually see if there's a mud bank or whether there's a sand bank. Um, but one of the biggest problems that Wrightsville Beach has is that it does get stuck a lot. And I say that by it does get gigged a lot. Um, and so it's it's got a lot more fishing pressure, especially for flounder up in that area than say in the Cape Fear or, or in the Southern areas. Okay. Um, you know, you go up north, now you go up north toward say Lee Island and you know, up before Topsail where it starts to thin out boat with, with boats and fishermen. And you can really find some, uh, find some good little spots up there as well. All right, keep going. Luke, take me into tactics. Okay. Um, so, so I, the way I, the way I like to fish flounder is I live bait fish. I'm a predominant live bait fisherman. I just about never fish artificial for flounder. Um, the main reason is that you just don't catch big fish consistently with artificial. Now, a lot of people are going to be like, well, I've caught a big fish. Yes, I know what happens, but I will guarantee you that if you use live bait and it's predominantly large live baits, you're going to catch bigger flounder more often. So this, um, this show is sponsored by Gulp, um, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> yep yep for sure maybe well, you, you didn't read the meeting notes <laughs> no I, you can mimic you can mimic all day long <laughs> no but no. i guarantee you nothing works on the end of your line harder than a live bait trying to get off a hook all right um so it's uh you know it's so so using using live bait is is is, is critical in, in big flounder fishing um and this is going back to, I said there was two things I was going to, I was going to say that I was going to keep going back to. One was T-O-W, time on the water. And the other is use big baits. It's a, big is not, you know, a couple inches. Big is not a mud minnow. You will never see a mud minnow on the end of my line for flounder. Um, they're just, I don't care how big they get, they're still too small. So it's, you know, I like using a four to six inch bait. Um, predominantly and even in the late fall I might go a little bit bigger um, people don't realize how big a mouth a flounder actually has if you catch one push on that lower jaw as much as you can and that flounder mouth has it has a three hinge jaw and will open up and it can engulf anything that fits inside of it I've sat there and caught a you know 12 14 inch flounder on a six inch bait they have no problem sitting there trying to take down a large bait um, so you're not going to catch as many fish, but I promise you the fish you get will be quality. Larger fish normally do not hit smaller baits. So the only time they will hit a small bait is if they have a really big temperature shock. Normally this happens in the late fall. You get a real big hard nor'easter. You get something where the temperature drops real sharp for a couple of days and that water, te that sea surface temp drops way down. And normally this is when they're on their way out to breed and then throw on some smaller baits and they might hit it. But nine times out of 10, man, use larger baits. The types of baits I like to use, I like to use mullet. I like to use um, pogies or menhaden. Um, and I hook them in two different ways and we'll go over that with gear later. But, um, you know, it, Ultimately, it's, you know, I like to use those baits mainly because they're the most prevalent, but honestly, size matters more than type. Okay. You get a big pinfish because that's all you can find. Put it on there. Put it on there. I'd rather take a big pinfish over a small mud minnow any day of the week. So, um, so that's, that's with, you know, going on with bait. Now, tactics wise, there's a couple different things I do. Um, and I know a lot of people like to drift for flounder. A lot of people go in the inlets and they drift for flounder. And these are going and, and doing your seminars. I got a lot of questions about how to catch big flounder drifting. And honestly, I don't. Um, in fact, I don't. I believe it or not, I rarely fish the inlet. 
Normally I'll fish it maybe once or twice in the spring and then a couple times in the fall, but I don't mess with it at all because nine times out of 10, you're going to catch small fish in there. Unless there's good structure, Wrightsville Beach has much better structure than, say, Carolina Beach Inlet. Um, but uh, but honestly, it's I don't really touch the inlet. And a lot of people will go and they'll drift and they'll catch 100 fish. But they might get one that may be over 16 inches or 17 inches or something like that. Normally, when I'm going out, I'm actually looking for one fish per spot and then moving on. Um, you know, and so when you go and you hit a certain spot, say you're fishing that one creek mouth, you know, I'll sit there and I'll do, you know, I'll throw out, say, for like a soda's worth. You know, you, you take a drink and, you know, and you hit a couple, you know, hit a, hit a couple spots, work at about one or two baits worth. If there's nothing there, there's nothing there, man. Don't wait for the bite. Get on and move on to another spot. Um, it's it's will a lot of times flounder fishing. I'll hit 20, 30 spots a day. Just stick and move, stick and move, stick and move. If they're not there, they're not there. And especially with larger flounder, it's not like there's going to be 50 of them there. So it's like you sit there and you throw it out, you hit it, and then you know, and then up oh, nothing else. Let's go on. Let's move to the next spot. Um, a couple of things to, to think about when you're actually out there fishing and you are in a little bit of a good bite. So say you're throwing out and you're getting a, you're getting a hit, you're getting flounder. Um, and I learned this from aquaculture guys, guys who actually aquaculture flounder. They have big pods and pools where they'll sit there and they'll feed and they, they'll throw a bait in and the smaller flounder will come up and grab it and move to the edge and the side. So the smaller flounders will, will fight a lot harder for the baits than the larger ones will. So, but they only do that when the larger fish are in the water. So if you actually have a bite where a flounder comes up and grabs the bait and takes off, there's a good chance that there's a bigger flounder hanging around. Them. So just know that like, if you catch a smaller fish and he takes your bait, like just screams it off right away, he's taking it away from a predator. So that bigger predator doesn't take it away from him. So that's one little, one little nugget you want to think about. If, if you're kind of in a good spot and you're starting to get a good bite, there's probably a bigger fish hanging out there i like it i like that a lot when you're anchoring up now you have to be in real stealth with the anchor you have to be real careful or the flounder are hard to disrupt honestly not really um you know they don't once again they they rely more on their camouflage and, and sitting down you know that's why a lot of times if you're out if you've ever been out and you're just kind of like walking around you know you'll step on a flounder or two and they'll shoot on off they're hoping that you just don't see them and you're going to walk right by them same thing with putting a flounder down now i wouldn't sit there and you know, do the, um, you know, do the hammer throw with the, uh, with the anchor putting it in the water. But, um, you know, but, but really I haven't seen a problem with that whatsoever. Um, you know, now granted, you know, I'll, I'll say that if you have the ability to get a power pole, it'll save your back and save you a lot of noise as well as, uh, as, as well as, uh, back time. So, um, it's, uh, that's definitely something if you're ever thinking about getting one, I promise you it'll change your life. You'll wonder why you haven't had one for so long. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, man, I, I wouldn't worry about that one bit. All right. So I'm not sure where you imagine this conversation was going. I know it's going to come up eventually, so I'm just going to make it happen now. It seems like it might be a logical place to sort of bring this in. So I'm, yeah. fo I'm following everything you said and I'm in the right spot and I get what I believe is a thump. I believe mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. What do I do? Am I letting it soak? Am I letting it digest? Am I setting a hook? Like okay, it seems so, like a perpetual debate. And so we're looking forward to you finally settling it 100% right now. I'd be happy to. This is easy. This is easy. Um, over in gear, we're going we're gonna to show you a reason why you can do this. But you flounder or do, do one of many things, okay? If you sit there and you feel a thump, okay, don't set the hook. OK, and don't sit there and count to 10 or anything like that. What you want to do is you want to make your line taut, OK, and then do a slow lift on that. OK, if you feel him wanting to keep go going to the bottom, OK, there's a good chance that he does not have that hook set in his mouth yet. OK, so main reason being is if that hook set is hooked, his head's going to go vertical in rapid shake to try to get that hook out. But if he's trying to get back to the bottom, either he does not know that he's hooked or he is not hooked. And most of the time it's he is not hooked. So when you sit there and you feel him trying to fight to the bottom, 
you know, sit there and then sit there and just slowly pull it, give him a couple seconds, pull it a little bit, keep that line tight because you don't want him to swallow it. Okay. And now a lot of reasons, a lot of this, this theory of counting to 10, counting to 20, counting to all this to me, I believe because people predominantly use kale hooks. Okay. Kale hooks with live bait to me have lost more fish than I can, I can even count. That's why I switched over to using a modified circle hook. What this allows is, is if you can imagine the fish's head like that and a kale hook coming up, you know it's a very short bend. So that bend comes up and then the barb of the hook lays directly on top of the fish's head. Well, the problem with that is that you have no exposed barb. And when you have no exposed barb, it's very hard to, to embed a barb that doesn't have a chance to get seated in the flounder's mouth. Now, by using a modified circle hook, which has a wider gap, it allows that barb to sit higher on the head and therefore gets a better hook set. So when you sit there, you feel that thump with that type of rig, you can sit there and pull up and have a better chance that that, that, that fish is going to automatically get hooked in the side of the mouth. I like that explanation. Our, our phones are lighting up by a bunch of old timers calling in to say you're wrong, but I like that explanation. Hey, I believe me, believe me. I, I understand it. But like I said, most of this stuff is stuff that I've figured out, you know, on my own and things that I've done on my own that, that I've said, okay, I've tried kale hooks for so long and I've tried circle hooks for so long and I get more hook sets with Kirk, Kirk circle hooks than I do kale hooks. And the fish almost never swallows a circle hook. So it's a good thing. It's is a win-win. Is it just pulling down to the bottom? What about pulling out to the side? What if they're running to the side? Is that the same thing? Probably not hooked because if they're hooked, you're going to get the shake? Yeah, when they're hooked, they're going to want to go vertical. They're not going to want to go back down. They want to go vertical and start sh those rapid head shake. It's because that's just it. When, when, they don't, when they don't head shake at all, they don't have the hook. If they head shake, they want to get that hook out of their mouth. So it's one or the two. It's one of the two. So now, now they have a very strong clasp, almost like an alligator, man. When they thump, that's what that thump is. That their mouth is so big and their gill plates are so big. When they, when they go after a bait, they use almost a vacuum technique. It flares those gill plates out and it creates a vacuum that sucks that bait in. And then they clamp right on down and they just sit there. So a lot of times, and then all of a sudden that digestion process is automatic. It's not like they're moving things around in their mouth. It's not like that. It starts coming and slowly on back, and then they start to digest it. So what, what enables you, when I said you feel that thump and you do a slow lift, what that's going to do is that's going to make that circle hook try to move to the side of the mouth and then have that point make contact with the fish. So once that point make contact with the fish, man, it's all said and done with crime. So when uh... – when I miss that flounder bite and I bring my bait up and I am turning to my buddy and going, yeah, it was a flounder. Look, it scaled my bait. What am I, what am I, where am I mistaken when I say it scaled my bait? Okay. Yeah, man. So this, one of the biggest misconceptions about flounder is that they scale their baits before they eat them. Man, I hear this everywhere and it's just not true. Okay, people are like, yeah, they, they do it. They roll it around in their mouth and they scale it before they swallow it. That is a big load of donkey, dude, man. It is literally, main reason being, that flounder is not going to sit there and take the chance of losing that bait, it's, that, that fish, man. That's its meal. Why would it sit there and mess with it in its mouth? Two, how is it going to do it? It doesn't have opposable thumbs. <laughs> and three, I can't tell you how many times I will fillet a flounder open and I've got a perfect bait in there with all its scales on it. But I'll tell you where that came from. That came from because people would bring their baits back and would have all sorts of teeth marks on it and no scales. And this, so it created this, uh, created this, you know, hypothesis that they scale their baits before they eat them. The problem is, is that once again, when you don't have an exposed barb and that engulf that that flounder is completely engulfed that bait and you, literally you're pulling it and setting the hook well it's scaling it because it's raking it across the teeth with no exposed barb and then it's got teeth marks all on it and you just ripped it out of its mouth so that's where that comes from um that old timer just called back he wants to have a few words with you after the show <laughs> i'll buy him a beer i'll buy him a beer <laughs> 
Luke, we're, I mean, I don't know if I'm supposed to push you into gear. Like, you know, we're, I think, yeah. you know, we're got to keep this moving along. Um, yeah, for sure. What, what can you so, tell me? Yeah, for sure. So um, I think you guys have my rig there somewhere. Um, so we're, we're going to start off on that because we've been talking about um, using, uh, w starting with the hook. So we'll, we're going to start at the other end. So what you've got, Normally, I use a 7'2 um, a to 7'3 uh, uh, foot spinning rod. I like 10 to 20 or, or 8 to 17 pound test most of the time because you, not that you need that much for flounder, but most of the time, like I said, you're fishing structure. So you're going to be pulling a lot of this, a lot of the rig through a lot of crap a lot of times. So that's why I go with the 30 pound uh, braid. I use 30 pound braid. I use about five or six feet of slide leader now this is different than your typical carolina rig the reason i use that slide leader and you'll see that on the green right there is that if you put braid if you put a a egg sinker on braid to slide up and down most of the time that line's so supple it'll tangle up in that in that egg sinker and it won't be doing exactly what you want it to do as well as as you're pulling that braid because it's abrasive it will make noise and it will and it will also uh, degrade the braid with that weight sliding up and down it because it is rough so i use a five foot slide leader of just mono you can just use regular 30 pound mono so it's 30 pound braid going with 30 pound mono um with a you have a slide sinker now your egg sinker has to be just as small as as you need it to be so you don't want a super heavy egg sinker because that is going to that's obviously fishing structure is going to get caught up more than the hook will so you want it just heavy enough to get your weight to the bottom you don't want it any heavier main reason too a lot of times if you're if you're fishing in silty type of water that egg sinker will drop in the silt and as you're dragging your live bait you'll drown your live bait in mud instead of it having fisher in the uh or swimming in the upper water column. Now, after that egg sinker, you're going to have a bead. And the only reason that bead is there is so the egg sinker does not get stuck on the swivel. So it, you go to your swivel. I like to use a Spro 80 pound swivel. Um, and then you'll have a 12 to 15 inch, um, 20 pound. I like Missouri power or uh, fluorocarbon because it's actually thinner for what it is. And so it has a less of a, uh, um, a look to it. Um, but, uh, but, but you're going 20 pound and this is what I was talking about earlier fishing structure a lot. And the reason I go 30, 30, 20 is because you're fishing structure a lot, you're losing rigs. So your best just to say, break your hook at that leader than to break your whole rig off. So that way, you know, you can sit there and tie a whole nother rig on. And I have like, I'll have 30, 50 rigs made. Um, just so I can tie them right back on. But that way I don't have to do this whole setup again. I can just replace that one rig. Now we go to the most important part where that fluorocarbon goes into the, um, uh, the hook. And I like to use a, a Eagle Claw Circle C, three, four, five off. 90% of the time I'm using a four off. Um, you're going to use on that Eagle Claw Circle C, you're going to snell that hook. Now, the interesting thing is that is not a snelled hook per se. So when you think about a snelled hook, you have that offset eye. So as you snell it, it pulls that hook straight. OK, but if you have a straight eye and you snell it, all of a sudden your one line is going around the loop of the eye, causing that uh, that hook to move sideways with any pressure that you put on the line. What that does is it enables you when you set that hook, that, that hook is not pulling straight out of the fish's mouth. It is literally sitting there and jackknifing 90 degrees in the flounder's mouth, always getting you a hook set in that side. So this is why I like this type of setup. It's, it's, it's a Carolina rig, but it's kind of got a lot of other things going on that I've kind of like learned that's the best thing for flounder fishing on that front. So as gear goes, this is, this is what I use. I like it. I mean, everything is sensible. You have down here, I, I notice a uh, pink Yozuri. Yes, yes. I like pink Yozuri because red uh, disappears. It's the first color to disappear in the water column. So as soon as you have that disappear, um, say, uh, as opposed to clear, believe it or not, clear has a reflection quality to it. But if it has a little bit of color to it, then it will it'll get rid of that reflective uh, type of uh, uh, aspect the deeper you go in water. And being that red, uh, leaves the um, 
the uh, the light spectrum first on the first top top end of the water column, then it kind of negates both the reflectiveness and seeing any type of color. So that's why I like using it. Awesome. Um, I think we're nearing the end. What about, I guess I'm going to ask for final thoughts on gear and then any final thoughts in general. Yeah. Um, so on the gear side, you know, the, the biggest thing too is especially going out flounder fishing. It's, it's, it's a weird thing, man. Like I said, you're, you're fishing. A lot of times you're fishing shallower areas. Um, be careful about where you go. If you haven't fished an area before, I like fishing toward a lower tide so you can see what you're getting into. Um, so if you know you're starting to get stuck, you can back right back out and be good. So it's like the biggest thing with flounder fishing, especially in these type of areas is be safe. Um, and, and learn about it. You don't have to take on the whole river at once, you know, take one section at a time, get to know that section, learn that section, and then move on. It's a learning process. Um, you know, trying to, you know, everything that I'm telling you literally just take a little bit of it and then go out and do it once again, time on the water, the more time you spend on the water, the more time you have tracking these fish, the better chance you're going to be able to stay with them and be on them all season long. Um, on the on the gear side you know have yourself a good you know if you're in a boat um just know your limitations uh on the areas and places that you can go um like i said safety is is paramount on that front and so if if you're good on that have yourself a good live well a really good live well um and and also have yourself a really good landing net so many of the landing nets i see out there have just they're tiny and these flounder will sit there and you'll scoop them right on up and then they'll flip right on out. Have yourself a bigger landing net. And I know it's a pain in the butt. Land, landing nets are probably the worst thing on a boat until you have to use it. It's always in the way. It looks horrible. And especially if you get a bigger one. But go function over fashion on this one. Go a bigger a bigger net is going to definitely enable you to, uh, to go ahead and get that fish. One thing also, let me bring up one smaller thing. When you're landing a flounder, always land it head first. They go crazy when you touch the tail. If you try to come in from the backside and you touch that tail, they'll skip off like a marlin. Sit there, always come in head first, come below it, and then lift up and you'll be straight. Luke, I knew I was tying your hands by only giving you this sort of 45 minute, 30 minute, whatever to talk. I mean, I know we could go more and Billy and I's plan absolutely, you know, before we even started was to bring you back. But thank you so much for this. We'll call this the first session on live bait fishing for flounder. I mean, it, it's been very enlightening. It's been very fun. Awesome. It's been my pleasure for sure. Um, Billy? Uh, I'm ready. I'm ready for the question. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed the presentation oh, and didn't awesome. just focus on the quiz question at the end. Well, I had to focus on the presentation to get the quiz question right. It was good. It was well, always good. So what is the Billy Thorpe big takeaway? <laughs> well, I have a list of them, but my favorite thing that he said is fish a spot, a soda's worth. All right. You like that measurement. Yeah, because sometimes I fish it like a case of uh, of soda's worth, and it's uh, irritating. So that <laughs> Diet me, soda? That gives me free. Yeah, absolutely. Look at me. I think I drink anything but. <laughs> oh, man. Why did I partner with you, Gary? You're always making fun and poking fun at me. <laughs> I think that's my role. I think that's in my job description well, that now, I'm writing down right now. Well, now you can really poke fun at me. My camera battery just took a toast, took a dive. So it's just me? It's just you, man. All you. Well, Billy, through me, wrap this episode up. <laughs> I'm going to pretend to be very to be listening intently as you talk about how to watch, how to listen. And I think you're also going to do a little sponsor thank you or, or something else. But I'm, here I am. I'm putting on my face that says I'm very much listening to what you have to say. Yeah, you can just move your mouth while I talk. And that will... <laughs> Uh, so if you if you want to watch, obviously if you're watching, you know how to watch here on YouTube, uh, if you or IGTV. Uh, if you want to listen, be sure to check out our podcast on iTunes and um, iTunes. Gosh, I'm so distracted right now. But anyway, iTunes, Spotify, anywhere you listen to podcasts, um, and that's how you can get in touch with us. But once again, just want to shout out to Marine Warehouse Center for being the sponsor of this episode. Uh, just an amazing group of people, amazing companies to go see them, support local business. And uh, yeah, and that's it. And, and make sure you submit your pictures and your photos and your videos and all that fun stuff. Well, right on. That's a wrap. Thank you all. Fisherman.
Thank you.